Last week, we began uh, a little two-week series um, called Get a Grip, and that phrase uh, was, as I shared last week, part of my middle school vocabulary, which was usually said with some kind of snide attitude like, hey man, just get a grip. Uh, I'm hoping this week and last week we are using it a little bit more positively to help us get a grip on uh, what we do with our faith, how to live out our faith Practically, we are answering the question of how do you do the Christian life? And so the Christian life is a is a very broad thing. There's lots of commands, lots of requirements, and uh, we want to know how do you do it? How do you practically live this thing and walk this out? You can go to the next slide. And actually one more. There we go. So my thesis this week is the same as last week. Um, we are we are trying to figure out what are the practical ways to live the way that we are asked to live. The greatest commandment, while already a summary of all the law, is still so broad that it can be hard to practically evaluate its execution in our lives without putting practical handles on its requirements. And so I've been using a rock climbing analogy this whole time, and, and it can feel sometimes like a rock climber looking up at this cliff when you are handed a Bible and said, live your life this way. Where do I start? There's thousands or hundreds of feet of rock ahead of me, and I've got to get to the top, and I'm just this little person. What am I going to do? Well, we are trying to use Scripture to find handholds to climb this thing. And I, again, I need to restate, we are a church that believes in salvation by grace, not salvation by works. You are saved because of the work of Christ on your behalf only, by grace through faith. You can get everything wrong that I'm about to say and trust in Jesus and be saved. But we hope that isn't how you decide to live your life, right? We hope that you aren't just after fire insurance but that you are, in fact, after a life of godliness. So, our text is the same as it was last week. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, and I'm actually only going to read to verse 31 today. Um, it's, uh, Jesus is in context here. He is being grilled by Pharisees and by Sadducees and by scribes and by people trying to trip him up and get him to say something that will make him lose favor in the eyes of the people so that he can be crucified without there being a big uproar and a riot in the crowds. And uh, he's answered successfully several questions, and then we get to verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. In his response, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, which we read last week. And he also quotes from Leviticus 19:18. Um, in the second part of the, or the second part of the great commandment that you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. The scribe is impressed by Jesus' answer. Jesus did not originate uh, the putting together of those two quotations from the Old Testament as a summary of the law. Um, it had been something that uh, he would have been taught as a young uh, child growing up in Hebrew school. And so his response is in line with what the scribe would have also said. And the scribe is happy with Jesus' Jesus' response. The scribe um, replies and reinforces and summarizes what he says in the verses that follow. Um, and Jesus compliments the scribe for not being far away from the kingdom. I would love to be able to zoom into history and follow that guy after he left the conversation with Jesus. I hope that he would be counted among the people who in Acts 2 and 3 uh, are recorded as uh, many of the priests and the scribes came to believe in Jesus after Pentecost. I'd like to think this guy was one of them because Jesus said he was already near to that. We don't know, but uh, I, I hope well for him. 
Last week, we looked at the first two aspects of the great commandment, having to do with your heart, soul, and your mind, the immaterial parts of you, the part of you that emotes and the part of you that rationally thinks. And we, we uh, looked at some practical ways to give those immaterial aspects of ourselves to God in full uh, 100% devotion. This week, we're going to get physical. We're going to look at what to do with our bodies and with the relationships that we have with other people and how we can use those to glorify God. So first, we're going to look at with all your strength, that phrase. Um, and just like I did last week, I want to give you a principle and unpack some scripture first, and then we're going to look at how to put our hands on this. The principle is that God asks us to worship him with the sum total of our capacity. Notice that I didn't say anything about strength in the principle here, because as we're about to unpack, um, the principle really doesn't have anything to do with how powerful your muscles are. The principle has to do with what to do with what God has given you and how to give that back to him. If you're following along in the outline, the first sub point of love God with all your strength is to love God with your, and I'm going to give you a made up word here, your muchness. <laughs> love God with your muchness. Um, the words that are used in the biblical languages here in, in Deuteronomy 6.4, which is the original source of the text, and then when Jesus quotes it in Greek, um, and when the scribe echoes what Jesus said, all of those words that are used in the original languages do not mean, are you strong enough to do something with your body? There are Hebrew words that mean that, and there are Greek words that mean that. So if it was, serve God with your muscles, if that's what he was after, he could have used words that said, serve God with your muscles. But he didn't. In the Hebrew, it's, it's really interesting. The word is meod, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. I studied Greek in, in seminary, but not Hebrew. This is all from other people. Um, meod is a very, very common word in the Hebrew. It's used over 300 times, and it is used as the adjective of intensification. So it's like the word very or much. So you could be sad or you could be mayod sad, very sad. You could be happy or you could be mayod happy, very happy. Sometimes in Hebrew they take the word mayod and they say it twice to really intensify it. Jacob, when he left the season of 14 years uh, earning his wives and his flocks and his herds, when he left the domain of his father-in-law, he was described as being mayod, mayod wealthy. He was very, very rich, right? So it's the word of intensification. But in Deuteronomy 6.4, it's the only time that the word meod is used as a noun, that we are to love God with our meod. So how do you take the word very or much and turn it into a noun? Well, you could smooth it over and say like with our abundance, but I think it's much more fun to take the word much and turn it into a noun and say muchness, because you'll remember muchness. So I am calling upon you to worship God with your muchness. Whatever it is that God has given you, your very, give that back to God in love. The word is, uh, because it's a weird thing to take an adverb and pretend it's a noun, it's interesting to see what other languages did when they were translating this from Hebrew into something else. So they translated it into Greek in the Septuagint before the time of Christ. And when they got to this word, they used the word didymus, which means power, ability, strength, capacity, the ability to do something. Um, and so the, the idea that the translators draw, drew upon was the capacity to act. Um, the... Old Testament uh, got translated into Aramaic as well, and we don't have a 100% intact Aramaic version of the Old Testament. We have some fragments and shards and pieces here and there, um, but we do have a fragment of Deuteronomy 6.4 in Aramaic, and when, when they got to that word, very strangely, they translated it into money. Um, they said, love God with all your wealth. 
And so the idea there was that your muchness was taken to be like your monetary um, power, the ability that you have to do things with your money, give that to God. When Jesus got to this, and he's quoting it, right, he is, he obviously memorized it in Hebrew as a good Jewish boy going to Hebrew school, but he is probably speaking Aramaic, but then it got recorded in Greek in the New Testament, and with the Greek manuscript that records what Jesus said, he didn't use the word didymus. He didn't use ability to act. He used the word uh, ischus, which is used 10 times in the, in the New Testament, so there's not a whole lot of wealth to pull upon as far as what this word means. It's only used 10 times, but most of the time, it has to do with a capacity to make change happen. I am effective. So worship God with your effectiveness is kind of the idea there. That isn't what came across in the English, though, because you're reading the word strength. Where did that come from? When the Latin Vulgate was written 400 years after Jesus, they took the Greek and they put it into Latin, and that was the Bible of the church for over a thousand years. Um, the Vulgate used the word fortitudinous, and we can see for, fortitude, strength, from there, and that kind of guided the English translators. So you, your word strength is, uh, is piggybacking on the Latin interpretation from the Greek that was written down when Jesus spoke an Aramaic word based on a noun, nounal use of an adverb in Deuteronomy 6.4. You're welcome. <laughs> Love God with all of your muchness is the point. Um, secondly, our muchness comes from God. And so when, when God asks us to love him with what he has given us, it makes perfect sense to say, well, you gave it to me. So if you would like me to give it back to you, that only makes sense, right? If somebody gives you a gift and then says, you know, if somebody gives you, it's a bad example. Someone gives you a crock pot and then they say, hey, sometime I'd like to come over and have some soup. Well, you obviously have the crock pot with which to make the soup. It'd be silly to say, I can't make soup. I gave you a crock pot, make soup. Okay. <laughs> God has given you things. And he would like you to love him with those things. All of our muchness is from God. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Your gifts are from God. And so we ought to love him with those gifts. You can go and go to the next slide. There you go. That was James what I just read. Go one more. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 um, says something similar. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Now, the immediate context here has to do with grace and salvation, not with necessarily material items of your life, but the principle stands. If God gave it to you, then don't pretend it's yours. Just say, thank you. How can I use this to love you? I have a home. Praise God, I have a home. It's well-built, made of brick. It's warm and strong. How can I use my house to love God? I have people in my home for a Bible study every other Friday night, and we do everything we can to love others out of those doors. I have a car that was actually given to me, uh, and I use it to drive around and do things that God lays on my heart. I have a family, and we love each other, and we do everything we can to encourage one another to love each other and love others well, what has God put in your hands? He gave it to you. And he asks you to love him with it. So it makes sense that we love God with the muchness that he's given to us. Subpoint number three, our muchnesses vary. So give back to him what he has entrusted to you. You might not have the same constellation of muchness as the person sitting next to you. So you might not be able to love God with their muchness, but you can love God with your muchness, right? We all have different gifts and skills and abilities and things that he has put in our hands, and you are only accountable to love God with what he's put in your hands. You are not accountable to elbow the guy next to you and make them love God with what he's put in their hands. That's between them and the Lord. But you have received muchness. Love God with what he's entrusted to you. Luke chapter 12, verse 48 says, everyone to whom much was given, 
of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So if you have small muchness, which is kind of a contradiction in terms, then you love God with your crumb of muchness. Good for you. If you have lots of muchness, then you need to love God with even more. And, and what that looks like is between you and God. But it is, it is not a good thing to say without evaluating the muchness that he has given you. Well, he hasn't given me very much, so I don't have to love him very much because I don't have very much. Well, think about it for a little bit. Spend some time in prayer on that question. Spend some time looking around at what God has given you and entrusted to you, and you'll be surprised at how much your muchness is. You really will. We're supposed to love God with our bodies. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So even if you don't have much in the account, even if you don't have much over your head, even if you don't drive much, even if there's not much in your closet, you have a body. What are you doing with it? You have the ability to act and do and perform. What are you doing with it? How are you loving God with your body? Subpoint number four, our muchness will be resupplied as we give it away in worship. Don't be afraid of running out of your muchness. When you have muchness to give, God replenishes your tank when you're using that muchness to love him and serve others. It's amazing what he does. Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, poured in your lap. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. If you say to God, I don't have much, and you only love him with a little bit of your much, then he'll only resupply you with a little bit that you've given to him. It really is true that as you love and pour out yourself to the Lord, you find joy and energy and replenishment and satisfaction that refills your muchness tank, and you keep going. Now, I'm, this is not a seed, faith, prosperity gospel thing. I'm not talking about give the church $20, you'll find 35 under the seat of your car. I did not say that. That's heresy. But as you serve God with all that you are, you will find that you are not depleted. You will find that you're invigorated and encouraged and filled with the Spirit to do more and more and more. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21 says, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. So we're supposed to be serving God according to his will because of what he's done in us in Christ, and he will do the equipping. And sometimes he asks us to step out and begin to serve and spend our muchness on his love before the equipping really kicks in. Sometimes you will feel like, I'm equipped to do this. I'm going to go. And sometimes you'll feel like... God's called me to do this, I'm going to go. And the equipping comes. And so I would encourage you to love God with your muchness on faith and watch him as he builds the muchness in you. So how do we get a grip on this? Let's, let's put our hands, or rather this week, our feet on the wall and get started. Last week, I dusted my hands every time I got to this part of the sermon. I said, let's get a grip. And we talked about grabbing the wall. This week, you know, I, I already used my hands. So now we're going to use our feet. And uh, here we have some awesome rock climbing shoes. And so these are way too small for me. I'm not going to try to put them on. But let's get our feet ready to hit the wall and find how we can grab onto this thing and climb the great commandment. The first grip I want to invite you to think about is how are you serving God with your physical strength. You can hit the next arrow. Sorry, I didn't give you two cues there. There you go. That's my bad. How are you serving God with your physical strength? 
So muchness is not just your strength, but certainly includes that. And since the word strength found its way through all those funny things into your Bible, we'll talk about it. Why are you tired at the end of the day? You lay down at the end of the day and you have expended caloric energy on something. What did you spend it on? Why are you tired? Is it because you've given your strength to serve the Lord? Or is it because you've given your strength to serve yourself? So all of us, at the end of the day, have that moment where you snuggle down to the blankets and you pull them up and you go, oh, what was behind the sigh? Was it, man, I spent a lot of time on me? Or was it, I, I poured myself out as an offering to the Lord today. And he got my, he got my power. He got my energy. Let's think about Sunday mornings. Do you come to church with energy to give in worship of the Lord? Or do you drag yourself through the door and hope that other people will give you their energy? I don't know. Think about it. Did you come to church with a task before you for which you prepared your heart and you are pouring out your strength on a Sunday morning to worship God and bless others in his body because of what Jesus has done for you? Or are you coming here and the ushers open the door and the custodial staff has cleaned and prepared and the worship team has practiced and somebody's going to deliver the word and there's people turning on the lights and the speakers and you are here just to have everybody serve you? Uh, does it really fall into loving God with your strength? Do you give the Lord your strength on Sunday morning, but that's the only time? Do you serve the Lord in some capacity here? Thank you. But then after you leave, God doesn't get your energy until Sunday morning the next week. How much of your energy, your strength, your caloric output worships God? Something to think about. Second grip of the day, how are you serving God with your talents and your gifts? He has given you strength. And he's given you power, and he's also equipped you with special skills and abilities that you uniquely have. Are you giving those back to God? Do you give back to God the spiritual gifts that he has given you? That's the whole point of a spiritual gift, right? Ephesians 4, the, spirit, the spiritual gifts are for the equipping of the saints and the work of service and the building up of the body of Christ. Not the hoarding and saying, gee, I can do this. Do you serve with your spiritual gifts only when people are noticing. And this is, this is going to strike close to the mark for some of you. If you have the gift of um, teaching, do you uh, hold at arm's distance the teaching of like two-year-olds? Because honestly, none of them are going to say, oh, teacher, that was beautiful. You changed my heart today, and I'm a new person. Thank you so much. But you, you would really be excited about somebody's home Bible study or adult fellowship, or if Mike were to ask you to fill the pulpit, you'd be on that because all the adults that are your peer group and whose opinions you value would come up to you and say, oh, great job. I say that as the guy that Mike asked to fill the pulpit today. Am I only doing this when people notice? Or am I doing this because I love God? If you have the ability to sing or, or play an instrument, would you only lead worship if you were invited to do so here, but not if I invited you to do it down in junior church, or if Kevin invited you to do it for the youth group? Because there's more notice up here. Do you give God your, your talents, your gifts, your skills and abilities in quiet, secret, behind-the-scenes ways? Or do you only give it for the applause? The next uh, grip we can get here is that we all live in the context of great personal liberties. Are you giving your liberties and your freedoms back to God? We live in America, and this is still one of the countries that gives you the most personal freedom, the greatest ability to act on your own desires and, and designs. How are you giving that back to the Lord? Is your Christian life 
taking advantage of the fact that you can do things here that Christians in North Korea would die to be able to do. Christians in India would get beaten to, if they did what you can do if you choose to. Christians in Iraq and in Afghanistan would be killed if they did the things that you can do. Are you doing those things? Or is your Christian life no more dynamic than an Afghan's Christian life? You live here. You should take advantage of those things. You should be doing the Christian life things that you can do because God placed you here. Are you participating in the culture to the fullest extent so that we can steer this thing called the American society in good directions? You live in a culture that cares what you think. Do you vote? Do you express your opinion winsomely, gently, in kind ways? Do you have your voice heard in places where it matters? Are you participating in society? Last one in this section, the last grip here. Perhaps you're retired and you feel like, well, my physical body doesn't have a whole lot of strength right now. Perhaps you're living on a fixed income and so you say, well, my account doesn't speak about muchness. Perhaps uh, you don't have a voice that a lot of people listen to. Perhaps you're thinking, what is my muchness? And the answer is time. You still have 24 hours in your day. Are you giving God your muchness, what he has given you? Are you doing what you can to bless his people, to bless the community that we live in? All of us have muchness. All of us have something that we can give back to the Lord in worship. All right, we're moving now to the second part of the great commandment. And you will love your neighbor as yourself. The principle here is that we must show the care for and behavior toward others that if it were shown to us, would most clearly communicate love. I've reworded it to make this not about how much I love myself, because there are people who legitimately deal with self-hate, and, and I don't want to pretend that that doesn't happen. There are some people who are really down on themselves, and so if their measure of love for other people is how much they love themselves, that might not turn into much love for them. And there are people who are way too full of themselves and their measure of self-love is a little bit unhealthy and if they were to put other people on that plane too, then we'd have idolaters. So I, I want to maybe rephrase that in a way that helps us think about it in a healthy way and, and I would say that if something communicates love to you, if something were to happen to you and you'd go, wow, that person loves me, do those things for other people. Do for other people what, if it were done to you, would communicate love. This is drawn from Leviticus chapter 19. For the first 20 verses of Leviticus 19, there's all kinds of things that you had to do to express love to the widow, the orphan, the sojourner, and the alien. And uh, several times through there, God says, you will do this for I am the Lord your God. You will do this for I am the Lord your God. Things like not harvesting all your grain, Things like uh, taking care of people that, that can't provide for themselves, the orphans and the widows, things of that nature. And at the end of that long list of things to do for others, it says, you will love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord your God. And so the love that we have for the least is really what's being talked about here. Jesus summarized Deuteronomy 6, 4, 5, Leviticus 19, 18, and he stuck them together. But as I've said before, he wasn't the first one to do that. Um, rabbi Hillel uh, was a very, very well-known rabbi in the inter intertestamental period, um, in the 400 silent years before Christ came. And much of what he taught was recorded in the Mishnah. And uh, Rabbi Hillel was approached by a Gentile who said, I'll become a proselyte, I'll become a Jew, if you can encapsulate all of Judaism while I stand on my left foot. In other words, however long I can balance on my less dominant leg, which is not that long. You've got that long to tell me what Judaism's about. 
And Hillel said, What you hate for yourself, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole law, the rest is commentary. Go and learn. In other words, I've done what you said, now you're my proselyte. Go and learn the rest of it. Um, and that's in Mishnah Shabbat 31a. So Jesus, Jesus uh, would have been taught these as the two pillars of the law, and he reflected that to us. So first sub point under here, our love for God is reflected in our love for his image bearers. If we are to love God with our everything, and if when I look at a fellow human being, I see in them a reflection of our maker, then my love for them is the love that I have for God reflected off of them. Picture every human being that you encounter as a mirror, not as a mirror where you see your face, but as a mirror where you see God. Every person you encounter is a mirror reflecting God to you. Well, that makes a whole lot of sense then why I need to love them. Because I'm not loving the broken animal behind the mirror as much as I am loving the fact that they have the imprint of deity on them. So I love the image bearer because I love the image maker. And so our love for God has to be reflective of that. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we all know this. Man was made in the image of God. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Everybody you encounter is a reflection of of God to you. James 3, in dealing with how to do, what to do with our tongue, says that it's crazy that we worship God and curse those who look like him. James 3, verses 9 and 10 says, with it, the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. You shouldn't be able to lift your hands in worship like you did this morning and sing the praises of God and then go home or go outside or stand up and say something derogatory about somebody else in the room. Can't happen. Shouldn't happen. Our love for God is reflected in our love for people. Second subpoint: our love for others is a matter of obedience not of feelings. It's not based on how we feel for one another. It's based on Christ's love for us. John 15, 12, and 13, Jesus speaking, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. He doesn't say, my great suggestion is that you love someone as I love you. He doesn't say it's a good idea if you love other people as I love you. He says this is my commandment, that you love one another. 1 John 4, 10 and 11, very famously summarizes that as well. It says in this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he has loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God has so loved us, then we ought to love one another. And so God has commanded this love in us. Third subpoint: love for one another is the proof of discipleship. Love for one another is the proof of discipleship. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, this is Jesus speaking again, that you love one another just as I have loved you, just like he said in John 15. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So when the outside world looks at the church, the way that they know that we're following Christ is not because of how we vote or how we dress or don't or what kind of music we use, or what kind of cars we drive, what kind of civic services we undertake. 
they will know that we follow Christ because we love each other and we love them in an extraordinary, supernatural way. And they go, wow, that's what a Christian is. And so we've been talking about how do you get a grip on this thing? How do you climb the, the great commandment? Jesus says the kernel, the, the touchstone, the piece that everybody will be able to see is your love for each other. So let's get a grip on this. Grip number one of this section. We're going to put on our other shoe now. Do you love as a function of your feelings? Do you love as a function of your feelings? Jesus never said to love people when you liked loving them. Jesus never said to love them when it's in accordance with your natural inclinations. Jesus said to love them because I commanded you and because I love you. And so my love to you gets reflected out to them. And that's a command. The great commandment is to love others as yourself. It's been reworded in different ways to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I think a lot of people, though, live under the reformulated picture that would say, I do unto others as they have done unto me. And that is scripture as well. But it's not the Bible. Do unto others as they have done unto you is a quote from Anton Zandavar LaVey's The Satanic Bible. And the principle of Satanism is you're good to those who are good to you. And those who are wrathful towards you deserve your wrath. So I'm just going to ask you, do you live your life according to the Holy Bible or do you live your life according to the Satanic Bible? And in this room, and in those in the sound of my voice, I'm sure none of you would want to say that you lived your life the other way. But we need to be aware of how we treat people. Do you do to your neighbor loving things when it is not in your natural inclination to do them? That's what Christ has called you to do. The next grip, do you love others more or less than you ought if you love people too little, then you fall, if, uh, you fall on the wrong side of John 13, John 15, 1 John 4, 10. But it is possible also to love people too much. If the mirror that you see when you see somebody that is reflecting God, and that's why you love them, because they are image bearers of him. If you get a little bit off, you might start to love them just like you love God. They are a reflection, and your love should be a reflection of your love of God, but they are not God, right? If you love a human in the same way that you love the Father, you are an idolater. And of course, we would all look at that and be like, well, it's not me. No, oh, think, 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 think for a minute. Do you prioritize your children's needs over your commitment as a follower of Christ are there ever times when you bend your Christianity in your house, what you know God is asking you to do, because it's uncomfortable for your kids? If so, in that instance, your children are an idol. Do you do that for your spouse? Do you do that for your parents? Do you do that for people who are paying attention and watching you? Do you not say things that might be hard for somebody to hear because you, you aren't sure how they're going to take it or you don't want to offend them? Then you're prioritizing their feelings over God's commands. In, in that instance, their emotions are an idol. We, we have to love people intensely, but we have to love them rightly as created beings underneath the Creator. So if there's ever a conflict between what you ought to do for a person and what you ought to do for God, God wins all the time, every time. Do you love somebody rightly? Do you love them more or less than you ought? Last grip as you're putting your foot on the wall. Are you willing to be inconvenienced or even hurt in order to love others? Christ's love for his church was painful. 
Christ's love for his church was agonizing. Are you willing to be even inconvenienced for your fellow believer? Do you have a good Samaritan kind of love that will derail his plans and will expend his resources and will get in the way of whatever he was doing going to Jerusalem from Jericho that day? Do you have the boy with a lunch kind of love who as you look around and you've got something and nobody else has, you can give it to God and say, I hope this helps. He gave up his security for a meal to the Lord. Do you have that kind of love that says, wow, I I can love with my muchness or I can love even with my little and that's okay. I love God and I love people enough to be expended. Our love has to be that kind of love. When you put all of these practical grips together, then we can be the kind of people that God has called us to be. So in conclusion, we want to chalk our hands and put on our shoes and hit the wall. And we want to see what we can do to climb this thing and be the people of God. So are you ready to climb? I've got a picture here of me on the only rock climbing thing I've ever done. Um, This is 1999. I backpacked through Europe for a little over three months with a buddy after college after we graduated, and we went to Santorini, Greece, not planning on being rock climbers at all. Um, The shoes that I had bought at the beginning of the trip had been walked through, and so we bought some leather sandals in a marketplace in Greece, and we finished our trip on those. And there was this cool, like, crag of rock rising up out of the middle of this sea in Santorini, and at low tide, you could walk from the beach through some... some, uh, ground that was exposed to low tide and you could climb this pillar and it wasn't like highly technical climbing it big corners it was pretty easy and so my buddy and I did we climbed at the top and this is me standing at the top of that thing and it was awesome I climbed it in sandals which was dumb but I got to the top and then when we by the time we made it to the top the tide had come in and the little land bridge that we'd used to walk out to it was now under about four feet of ocean And so we hung out on the top of the rock and waited for the tide to go out again, and then we climbed out. It was super cool. I used a lot of hands and footholds to get there. I'm going to demonstrate just real quick. I've got Joseph Moore, who's coming up here, and he's going to demonstrate rock climbing for you. Come here, buddy. It's a a small thing. Can you do it? Can you do it? Can you climb it? Woohoo! Joseph Moore, everybody. There you go. Thank you very much. And, uh, and we, I've got a much, much more impressive thing. If you are a climber at all, you probably know the name Dan Osman. Dan Osman got the Guinness Book of World Records for the fastest descent on a 400-meter uh, uh, stretch of wall in Yosemite called, um, called Lover's Leap. And I've got a video of him doing it, getting the world record, and uh, this is the kind of climbing that we want to be able to do spiritually. Let's watch this video.
So that was the world record climb. Um, it was done in 1997, and uh, he is an, a legend. He, um, you might think he's got a death wish. He all, often told people, no, he's got a life wish. He wants to push the edges of living and experience what is possible. And I would say, not that I want you to do that, but I want you to spiritually have a life wish. I want you to push the edges of Christian living and see what is possible. Um, scattered around the room, there are these little uh, yellow pieces of paper, and I would have been smart to grab one on my way up. They're not on every seat, but they're on every couple of seats. You're close to one. And on this piece of paper, there is every opportunity to serve at Pleasant View Bible Church. And it starts with a section that says, open to everyone. And we mean everyone. If this is your very first time at Pleasant View Bible Church, and you're like, huh, I want to try this thing out. You can do these things, and you really can, like everybody can do those things. Um, the second section is, says, open to committed believers who feel like Pleasant View is their home. So you're a Christian, you've walked with Jesus for at least a little bit of time, and you're like, yeah, I want to be a part of this team. You can do these things, right? And there's more things there. Then there is a section of stuff that says open to members of Pleasant View Bible Church. We believe in membership at this church. Membership means we verified your Christian testimony. You have been baptized by immersion, and we've watched you live among us for about six months at least, and we know that you're on the team and you're running in the same direction we're running. You can do these things. Um, and then there is a list that says future employment opportunities at Pleasant View Bible Church as we move into our strategic plan, and we are going to be doing a, a child care ministry here at the church. We're hiring people. Um, and so some of these positions are not going to be hired until uh, July, August. Uh, one of these positions, we're going to start hiring in February, and that's the director. So you can look at the opportunities that are here, whether you are a, a brand new person and you're wanting to see what we're like and you want to play in our, in our sandbox while you make up your mind. Things for you to do here. If you're a Christian and you feel like you belong here, things you can do there. If you are a member, there are some other things that you can do there. And if you want to join the team officially and like get a paycheck for it, there are some things that you can do there. I want you to pray about this. I want you to love God with your muchness, with your time, with your efforts, with your caloric energy that he has given you. I want you to give it back to God and to his people. And so um, I would like you, and again, it's not every seat. I figured there'd be about one per family out there. Take one of these home Think about it, pray about it, put this before the Lord and say, God, what would you have me do? And then when you've made up your mind, and I, I honestly, let me just be truthful with you, I expect every human being in this room or in the gym to do something. We don't call you to come and sit. We call you to serve. Do something, give back to the Lord, bless the church, bless people. Um, you can either, if you know what you want to do right now, you can fill it out and circle something, and we'll reach out to you and get you lined up. Or if you want to take some time to think about it, pray about it, uh, call the church, send in an email, drop this in the offering next week, and, uh, and we'll be in touch. Love God with all you are. We're going to invite the worship team to come up as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for giving us much. Thank you for calling us to love you with our muchness, with all that we are. God, I pray that people would would get on that, would be about that, that we would not be a community of receivers, we would be a community of servants and lovers of you and lovers of others. Be with us as we walk in obedience. In your name we pray.